Hey, what's up everyone? I put an EGW sear and hammer in this 4.6 inch 1911 I just built. I inspected these parts before modifying them. I know the EGW ignition kits that contain this hammer and sear are popular and many people drop them into their pistols. Likely they adjust the sear spring and call it good. I wanted to make a video explaining their geometry and engagement relationship if left unmodified. Of course, this will vary a little due to manufacturing tolerances held on the parts. I don't consider any 1911 part drop-in. Every part should be fit or at very least checked for proper fitment and function when installed in a pistol. Without proper fitment, it's likely that performance and safety margins will suffer. That actually applies to all firearms and most mechanical systems for that matter. EGW states as much in the description of their ignition kits. There will be links in the description to relevant videos of mine. If you have questions about what I present here, those questions can probably be answered by one of those other videos. I will also list the pages from the Kuhnhausen manual that I present diagrams from. Let's get into it. I buy a lot of parts from EGW and I have generally found them to be good quality at a reasonable price. Their hammers are expensive, 75 to $95. The stainless steel one I bought was $95 and had quite poor machining quality. The countersinks around the pinholes were rough. Both pinholes were a bit too tight. There were some rough edges and tiny burrs, a gouge here, and uneven and rough chamfers all around. I should have sent this back. This is unacceptable quality, especially for the price. I still buy EGW parts, but will never buy another one of their hammers. Before we get into this inspection and analysis, I want to provide some information about my measurements and a disclaimer. My sear and hammer jig pin spacing is two thousandths off of nominal ordnance spec. I used my 3D modeling software to analyze what difference this makes in engagement angle between a nominal spec hammer and sear, and it's about four tenths of a degree. So for all intents and purposes, I consider the relationship I see in my jig as representative of nominal ordnance spec pin spacing. I've seen more variation in pin spacing than this measuring various 1911 frames. Of course, after matching a hammer and sear pair in my jig, I use extended pins in the frame to make sure the relationship will be similar in the pistol that they will be installed in. The accuracy of the measurements you will see from my calibrated image analyzing software is about plus or minus one thou for lengths and plus or minus one degree for angles. I will be comparing the geometry and engagement relationship of this hammer and sear to how I modify and set up my hammers and sears. How I do my trigger jobs and tune my ignition components is based on my preferences for trigger action. What makes a trigger action good or bad is largely subjective. I'm not saying the way that I like my 1911 triggers is right or the only correct way. It's just my preference. EGW states their sear has neutral tip geometry. That is the primary face is at 90 degrees with respect to a line drawn through the sear pinhole center and the corner of the primary face. This is very much the standard. I don't think I've ever bought a sear that had a different primary face angle than this. Looking at the ordnance diagram of the sear from the M1911 Kuhnhausen manual, we see that this face matches the original sear design. This sear deviates from the original design because the secondary face has been cut, but this is a common modification to modern sears. The primary face is about 23 thousandths wide. My primary face width generally comes out around 20 thou after I set my engagement depth and I don't let it get below that. The secondary face is about 57 degrees with respect to the primary face. I adjust the angle and depth of the secondary cut to set my engagement depth with a hammer hook. so. The exact angle here isn't of much importance as I see it. There is a nice sharp corner that has been barely broken between the primary and secondary faces. The hammer hooks are 90 degrees. That is the common modern hammer hook angle. The original design is a slightly acute 86 degree angle. That is the sum of these two angles here. The hammer hooks are about 24 thousandths long. This is a bit long for my liking. I cut my hammer hooks to 20 thou, but no shorter. The sear primary face and hammer hooks are coming together at around a 12 and a half degree angle. There is around 19 thou of engagement depth. I took some more measurements of the sear and the hammer and put them into my 3D model and adjusted the pin spacing in my model to match my jig. The measurements I got in the model are within my measurement error. This is really to check the engagement angle though, because it's harder to measure in the software than the engagement depth. 
This is what I call a negative engagement relationship by the definition that I prefer, which is a dynamic one. That is, the sear falls away from the hammer hooks as it pivots forward. A positive relationship lifts the hammer hooks slightly as it pivots forward. I prefer crisp breaks. That means minimum engagement depth. I target 10 to 13 thou of engagement depth. I cut all my sear faces about three to six degrees more positive. This just pushes the engagement into a slightly positive relationship where the sear lifts the hammer as it pivots forward. This way I can reduce my engagement depth, meaning less creep in the break. If you're wondering, there's about a one-to-one -one ratio between the distance from the sear tip to the pivot point and where the disconnector contacts the sear and the pivot point. So if I have 10 thou of engagement, there's roughly 10 thou rearward travel in the trigger from the wall to when the hammer releases. This pair has more engagement depth due to the longer hammer hooks and shallow secondary cut, which makes the primary face wider. I think this increased engagement depth is appropriate for the sear primary face angle and negative engagement relationship. Due to so much engagement, you could probably adjust this trigger pretty light and not run into hammer follow. But this comes at the expense of more creep in the brake. So that's the end of this one. I hope you found this interesting, informative, or helpful in some way. Remember, the geometry of the sear and hammer in their engagement relationship will vary a bit due to manufacturing tolerances. I suppose the purpose of this video is really to highlight that if you don't properly fit 1911 parts, you may be leaving performance or safety margin on the table. Depending on your preferences, if you drop this sear and hammer into your 1911 without modification, you may or may not like the resulting trigger action. This doesn't even take into account sear spring adjustment or pre and over travel adjustment at the trigger, any fitting required at the disconnector for proper function or the selected mainspring. Anyways, thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.